Well, uh, as I have mentioned uh, before, we'll start the new message series and it's called New Life. In New Life, the title itself can actually be a little bit misleading because a lot of times when a pastor or a teacher is talking about new life, they're uh, really exploring to uh, those who do not know Jesus as leader and forgive their lives and presenting the gospel message or the good news of Jesus' life and his sacrifices and his victories and the, the uh, knowledge that the Holy Spirit could be moving convicting, encouraging, and the hope that people in the free world will turn their lives over to Christ. A lot of times we talk about the new life, like uh, being born again, as it talks about in the scripture. And while that's uh, going to be interlaid throughout, like it usually is, I'm not sure if you ever noticed, but almost every message I give, we end up talking about be, uh, being a Christian, which means that you've accepted Jesus as leader and forgiver in your life, by acknowledging with your mouth and believing your heart he is the Son of God, died and rose again for you, and thus you are saved, according to Paul in Romans. And we do that every week because I never want someone to get out of here not hearing that. And secondly, I just want to keep pounding it, so if you're over in your mission field and someone comes up and says, how do I have Jesus in my life? Well, you accept him as leader, forgive in your life, by acknowledging your mouth, believing your heart he is the Son of God, died and rose again, and thus you are saved, and again I pray with you. This is we're always there. But the message here is as a whole, then the main points of it, I don't think really fall into that as much as speaking to those of us who have accepted Jesus as leader and forgive already, that have sprouted in new life, but feel calling from him to, uh, that he's doing something different, that he's doing something new, that he's calling you to maybe express yourself into a new ministry, or calling you to uh, do something drastic that's outside of your normal realm, or to grow in an area that you've been holding on to yourself, or to, move out of your life something that's not holy because He wants you to have more holiness in your life. That there are things going on where it seems that He is sprouting out new life. And kind of, a couple of things that kind of spoke towards this, again, if you, if you weren't here last week, is this image that's on your screen, which is kind of a, a, a vision type thing that was coming to my mind a couple of times before I went on sabbatical, of a sprout that had already come up out of the ground. It wasn't a seed that needed to divorce, but it was already some new life there. Um, the other thing that came up right before I went on sabbatical was the scripture, if Scott, if you put up the scripture from Isaiah, that a buddy of mine sent me in an email, not knowing that I was going on sabbatical, not knowing about this spout picture that kind of kept coming to my head. But the scripture basically says, Behold, I'm doing a new thing. Forget about the old things. I'm doing something new. There's new life. Don't you already perceive it? Don't you already see it? Don't you already feel it? And as I got that scripture and I went out into my little camping experience, I was just painfully aware that as a church, yes, there are new areas of new life with the home groups, with the youth groups, some other things that are going on uh, behind, the, behind the scenes that we're talking about and people are talking about. Uh, within my own life, within my own family's life, yes, I see some new things. I perceive new things. Not even things I can see. I just I feel God's doing some new things. And then as I talk with you guys, it's like, man, yeah, it just seems to be everywhere that God is stirring the pot. God, God is doing something. And so I went out into the woods and kind of started with the scripture and started working backwards for as long as it seemed like the Spirit was blessing that thought process. And uh, that ended up me up to where we start, which is Isaiah 42. So if you have your Bibles, if you would, go ahead and go to Isaiah 42. Again, if you don't have Bibles, there's always Bibles in the back that you can borrow, still keep, whatever you want to do. Um, but we're going to dig into Isaiah 42 as we go into like this new... Again, this new message here is on new life. God doing something different. Some, something maybe, again, you can't even see yet, but you just feel it. You just feel it. You're waiting, uh, or maybe even kind of intimidated to take that first step. Well, that's what we're going to dig into. And as you turn into Isaiah, let me just kind of give you a little bit of context. Isaiah was a prophet of God uh, in the nation of Judea. He loved his nation, loved his nation. He was a prophet. His ministry spanned a little over 50 years, over five kings. Uh, fifth king didn't like him too much, so he had him killed. But besides that, uh, kings kind of bartered back and forth with him because he was a very courageous man. He had no problem going toe-to-toe -to -toe with a king or anybody else and all the ups and downs of their country as long as God gave him a message and he was going to give that message. And so he was a man who hated sin. He hated fake religion. He was just a very bold uh, man of God. And then one of the things that he gave us that is just a beautiful gift to us is through, the, through God, through the Scripture, he gives us one of the most incredible books of the Bible when it comes to Messianic uh, prophecy. That in this book, that, that you know, hopefully you found by now, if you're still looking, it's after Psalms and Proverbs, but uh, it, it's filled with things that pull just very blank 
Pope, I'm just very open, talking about Jesus' quote in John the Baptist's ministry. And he talks about Jesus' struggles. And he talks about Jesus' death. And he talks about his resurrection. And he talks about his second coming, which still hasn't happened. All 2,000 years before Jesus ended up in that manger. That God just revealed all these things to him as he spoke through those. And it's really a beautiful, beautiful book. If you've never gone through it, it's just so easy to see these things through the hindsight uh, of Jesus' life that God was announcing his son before he brought him to the earth. It's pretty incredible. And 42 is kind of a part of that. 42, the section we're going to go through today is called a servant song. And there's four different servant songs in the book of Isaiah. And it basically explores the relationship between Jesus and God. And everything we're going to look at through this, we're going to look through that lens of Jesus' relationship with God. But at the same time, we're going to go another step within it. Since Jesus is our example, Jesus is our role model, Jesus is our Lord, we're going to look at what that means to us today as servants of God and how He looks at us and how He holds us and how He challenges us. So that's why I put this video at the very beginning. Is do we truly want to be like Jesus? is a very profound question that we need to ask ourselves rhetorically, even right now in this moment. Because if the answer is yes, this scripture is going to come to life to you. And there's going to be some things that God already has in your heart that He's just going to start fueling through this. And if the answer is no, then you're going to have some walls that are going to block you from some of that. I just want to be honest about that up front. Because Jesus, if He's your mascot instead of your Messiah, there's going to be two different ways you're going to receive this today. And my hope is, is you receive it like He's your Messiah. If we want to be like him. Does that make sense? Okay, so enough setup. Let's dig into some scripture. We just kind of see where it leads us. Isaiah 42, verse 1 says this Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him, and he will bring justice to the nations. Just starting out here, just kind of getting this going, let's look at this from Jesus' viewpoint. And when I was studying this, I kind of got this mental image that I'll, I'll share with you of Jesus being here on the earth, maybe, I don't know, he's like 32 years old, a couple years into his ministry, a year before his death, he knows it's coming. And he's gone through all kinds of, of highs and lows, but a lot of lows, a lot of beating up in his life. Again, if you want to be like Jesus, there's going to be some tough days within that as well. And I was thinking about the times of you know, people come in mass, 5,000 people come to him, Loving him until he tells them what it takes to follow him, and every one of them turning around and walking away. Just how that must have broke his heart. Or even just the one, because he just loves the one that would come and say, Jesus, I want to follow you. And he's like, that's great, but I can see in your heart that your, your money and you being able to have control over that is more important than I am to you. So if you just give that up, then you can follow me. And the guy said, he just walked off. You know, just the abuse that he must have went through in those things and knowing what was to come. And I, I got thinking about those times that he would go to the garden or the Mount of Olives just to pray, to kind of be involved himself with his father. Or maybe times that he would go to the temple to teach. You know, people loved his teaching because he taught the great authority to, according to the scripture. And he would stand up and open these scrolls and read these scrolls of scripture uh, to them. And I thought, you know, I just wonder what it would have been like that day that he didn't physically want to preach. And maybe he's just don't beat up by all this stuff. But just from his obedience, he was preaching. And then he comes across this one voice knowing that it's his dad talking about him and how he would react, saying, you are my servant. I uphold you. It's okay, son. I've got this. You are my chosen one, and I delight in you. you imagine Jesus' response in that moment in front of all those people, a little tear coming up in his eyes, and he's like, what's up with Jesus? I delight in you, son. I put my spirit on you. And you're being justice to the nations. The whole plan that we've had since the very beginning is going to work. It's okay. Just keep going. And I thought, man, just what an intimate moment that must be as Jesus reads us from his Father. What a lovely moment that would be. That I realize that as one who follows him, as a child of the risen God, that he says these things to me too when I'm going through tough days, that I am a servant and that he's got me. And maybe somebody just needs to hear that today. If you're a child of the risen king and you're trying to, to live right and you're trying to be like Jesus and you're being an integrity and you're walking, you're taking some hits from it, you're losing some things out of it, Jesus might just want to be saying to you, the Father might be saying to you today, I've got this. I uphold you. You're not going to fall. I've got you. I chose you. According to the scripture, it says we did not choose him, that he has chosen us. This is very much true for his son as much as it is to us. We are chosen by him. We're upheld by him. That he takes delight in you. 
He takes delight in you. Feel feeling like alone today because you've lost a lot because you've been trying to go for holiness and those type of things. Just take this at least. Jesus and, and give you know, God looks at you and takes delight in you. He loves you. According to the scripture, his spirit is in us. If you accept Jesus as leader, forgive in your life, this Holy Spirit resides within you. And according to Jesus, we can do greater things in our life today than what Jesus did when he was here because Jesus is at the right hand of his Father interceding for our behalf. I'm not sure why we're not seeing it. Well, maybe we're all sure why we're not seeing it in some places. But God's calling us to get to there. God's calling us to that kind of faithfulness. He says, well, my spirit is upon you. My spirit is within you. And you will make a difference. That dream that he's put on your heart for his glory, not yours, you will make a difference if you're following and obedient to him. Isn't that a lovely first verse? Isn't that a lovely first verse? So if we're talking about God's calling us, maybe some new things, or calling us to some deeper places, or things along that line, maybe he's just start out with this message just saying he loves you, he's got you, he delights in you, you've got the power of the Holy Spirit on on your side, you are going to make a difference. Absolutely know that up front. Because the thing is, is when the real part hits, it's going to be hard. And the, the things are put into the action, you know, the, the, the feet to the path, that's hard. And he talks about that in these next verses. Look at this. It says in verse 2, as he's talking about Jesus and what he would be, he would say, uh, He will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on earth. In his law, the islands will put their hope. You say, well, Tonda doesn't really say anything about anything hard. Actually, this is where it starts getting pretty real pretty quick. And this is a thing that we've talked about several times because it's over and over and over again in the Bible. We are called, just like Jesus here, to be 100% love and 100% truth. And that's what he's talking about here. Jesus is 100% love. He will not shout. He's not crying out. He's not taking, being, you know, beating people over the head with the, his message. But a bruised reed, he's not going to break that. Someone that's broken, someone that's hurting, he's not there to break those things. He's here to tend to that and minister to that love. A smoldering wick, like, man, I just don't have any fire left, man. He's not here to go off and find you. But he's here to tend that fire and to get those things coming together. Jesus came in full love. At the same standpoint, he came in full truth. In faithfulness and truth, he will bring justice. He will bring the truth as well. He will not falter, he won't be discouraged, and he establishes justice on the earth and the law, the islands, not just Judea, but all the areas of the earth, all the, even the things that are spread out are going to delight in his truth as well. And I started thinking about these things in Jesus' life, and I was like, well, you know, Jesus, for the most part, definitely had those times of love where he was being challenged, he had people up in his face, he was on trial, whatever the case would be, but he could have been like, look, I did this, 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 you guys did this, this, and this, and defend himself, and he didn't say a word. You know, we definitely see those times in Jesus' life where he was gentle and just loving. We see that time when he was taken and, you know, what, drawn in the sand, and they brought a woman who was caught in adultery to him and threw, threw in front of him and says, hey, the law says we got stoned, and what do you say? Jesus could have got up and went toe to toe. They were trying to trap him. They, no matter what he answered, we got him. And he just stood up and said, well, we have best. no sin, no, go ahead, but we're stoned. And he went back to the drawing in the sand and just packs me up. But he was gentle. He was just a, a God of love. When they all left, he looked at the woman and said, what? Is there no one here to accuse you? No, Lord, there's nobody. He said, I don't accuse you either. But that was the love. And the blood caught the truth. Go and don't do it anymore. Get out of this. You don't need this in your life. Stop. Now, he wasn't afraid to go at it. I mean, we've got times where he goes in the temple and he's throwing tables as a whip in his hand and you guys took my father's house, the place of worship, turned into a den of thieves. And there's another time he's talking to Pharisees and Sadducees and a bunch of people and saying, you bought the vipers, you hypocrites, going toe to toe. But you know what? I don't think he did any of those outside of love. I truly don't. I think when he was going toe to toe with the Pharisees and Sadducees, he loved the people that were listening and were so tired of religion that he realized he had to lay it out to them to say what I'm talking about and what they're talking about are two different things. And he loved them enough to make that distinction. And I think he loved the Pharisees and Sadducees enough to say, I'm going to be very well with you, very blunt, because nothing else has worked and I want to shape you and I hope that you return to the living God. And that's why church discipline is so tough. Is when you have to do something that, that hurts and that's hard or, or people that you love hoping that they come back to you. To God. Same thing with the money changers in the temple. 
I hope it shook up those money changes. And they said, you know what? I didn't even think about it that way. You're right. They acted out of love. Here's the thing. When we start following God and we start adding maturity and growth to our, our spouse or that area that God's calling you to, and we're called to be in love and in truth as well, it's going to get dicey and it gets hard. And there's going to be tough conversations sometimes and there's going to be joyous conversations sometimes. And there's going to be tough decisions to make in love and in truth and there's going to be easy ones to make. But the simple fact is, when we're doing it His way, we end up where God wants us to be and there's no better place to be than where He has us. I'm no more of a, a fan that, of some of the things that He calls me to do than you are. But I want to be where He wants me to be. Does that make sense? And so as we think about these things, we start struggling with, okay, but I've been waiting so long, I, I have to give up something I really am just uncomfortable giving up with the security that I have. To give that up, you know, it's just overwhelming. And we're going through these things. Our God wants to speak to that. And so he says in this next part, and we're just going to do the first course for us because he, uh, he wants to make sure we understand he's speaking to us. Verse 5, he says, this is what God the Lord says. He who created the heavens and stretched them out and spread out the earth and all that comes out of it and gives breath to its people and life to those who walk on it. In other words, as he said to his son, he says to us, but God, you don't understand, I'm overwhelmed, I can't control this, not a problem, I've got it. I'm the one who created the heavens, I'm the one who stretched them out, I'm the one who created the earth. Where all the problems are that you're freaking out about, I created that, I put that out. But God, you don't understand, people be mean to me. No, no, you don't understand, those people I gave the breath to, it's all covered. So as Jesus is sitting there reading this, saying, oh my goodness, this thing that is going to come my way, this thing that he prayed, Father, if you could just take this cup away from me, but not my will, your will be done. But he's on there, God's saying to him, I've got this. I, from the very beginning, this has been planned out. And he says the same thing to you today. Whatever you're struggling with, whatever you're thinking about taking that faith step with, he's got this. He's got control over it. Every single thing that you are maybe stressed out about is in full submission to him. Yes, people have free will, but he wins each and every time. Yes, time it might get scared. Get, uh, scary, it might get a little dicey, but God wins every time. Sometimes it might hurt, sometimes it might be overwhelming, but your children are watching, and as a child of the risen God, you want to show them what it looks like to be in integrity to Him. Are you with me? God's got this. He is the one that's created all these things. In verse 6, He continues saying, after saying, This is who's about to speak to you, this is what I say. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles. These words must have been overwhelming to Jesus. I know you're overwhelmed, son, but I've got an honor and control, and you're not in this by yourself. I love you. I've got your hand. I've called you in righteousness. I'm going to make you a covenant for all the people. I've got this. You're going to be, bring justice. What's the last time? Uh, you're going to be a light for the Gentiles. You're going to be a light for the world. How reassuring that must have been for Jesus. But in the same way, I hope it's reassuring to you if you're starting out on something new that we're going to be talking about for the next six weeks. And I hope that you're praying about it and digging into for the next several weeks. He's saying, I've got you. I've got your hand. I'm calling you in righteousness. I am not a covenant between God and the world. His Son, Jesus Christ, is. But I'm an ambassador for that covenant. I'm the one that can take it into my mission fields and introduce others to it. I'm not the light to the Gentiles, but I'm the light in the world as I reflect His light into, the, into this place. And some of us, again, are just going to beat up. That's okay. Because according to this, God does not take in on a whip that's just smoldering. If you've got it there, He'll fan it if you give it to Him. He won't snap a broken meat. He's going to take a minister to it if we give it to him. Here's the result if you follow him in this journey that he puts in front of you. Whatever it is, and I don't even know what the name of yours is, I just know the name of mine. Verse 7, he says that you will open the eyes that are blind, free the captives from prison, and release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. That is unbelievably true of Christ, but it's unbelievably true with us as ambassadors of the risen God, as the Holy Spirit leads, and we say yes, that we will see people that we care about, people that we love, people that are on our hearts, 
go from blindness to being able to see the light of Jesus Christ. Being able to go from bondage into freedom as they are delivered from the sin according to his victory as they come to him. But they were taken to the dungeons. I mean, jail, you can kind of find people in dungeons and send away. It's really hard to find people there. I mean, I, I think if jail's not even enough for God to talk about, it. he's saying there's people that you, go, that you think are outside my reach. There are people you think are too far gone. Now I want to go into those dungeons and I want to bring them out too. If you follow Jesus in that faith walk, it's on your heart, Christian. And I'm telling you, I've heard enough from you, you guys to believe that almost all of us have got something stored up in our hearts right now. So I'm saying it boldly, whatever is on your heart, whatever this faith walk is, He's got this. And He's going to use you, and He's going to walk this with you in an intimate way, and He's going to use it to the glory of His kingdom as people come to Him. And that is unbelievably overwhelming to me. I'm not worthy of that. I don't know about you, but I'm not worthy of that. But through Jesus Christ and His faithfulness, we are righteous, we are clean, and by Him we can stand with strength and we can do this. Verse 9 might speak to somebody who's struggling a little bit and saying, Tom, you don't know what I've done. I mean, verse 9, I know it's keeping me. I'm coming back to it. Verse 9. See, the former things have taken place. In other words, you see, the past is the past. So if you've been going, man, Tom, I messed up, that's gone now. And if you're saying, but Tom, I've done so much for him already, don't I just get a break? That's gone now. The things of the past are the past, the former things. And new things I declare, before they spring into being, I announce that to you. I love this verse in the context of Jesus, because he said 2,000 years before Jesus, it's coming, and I'm announcing to you up front, so you can be anticipating and excited. And so when you see it, you go, that's what we've been talking about for 2,000 years. I love that. But you know what? I'm convinced that he's doing that in our lives as well, as a church and as individuals, where he's saying, I'm doing new things. Some of them you can't even see, but you know what? I put them on your heart. I'm putting vision, and I'm putting things out there, and I'm getting anticipation already there, so that when it comes, you know it was me and not you. And that's really important for us to have up front for all of us, period. Is that any time you through faith stuff, just like we said last week, it causes us to three things. One is to be in prayer. So if you're thinking about this today, going, yeah, you know, I kind of see what you're saying, I'm kind of with this, I hear this good speaking, then you immediately should just be going into prayer and soliciting your God to be actively involved in the thing that He put on your heart in the first place. Praying, striving after Him. Second thing is being in action. I don't know what to do next. Just do what is in front of you. No bless that. He just wants to see that we're in action, doing what we can do. And then three, acknowledge and find that place that where I stop and God has to step in to get to where He's promising because I can't do it on my own accord. Because that will always be there if you have a real faith step in front of you. If you've got something on your heart, you're like, I'm going to do this and I can do this. Then there might be a moment that you might want to step back and say, God, am I hearing you correctly? Because He hardly ever, if ever, calls us to something we can do of our own accord because he wants the glory for himself. If I can do it by any other means, there might be a problem. This is where verse 8 comes in. He says, I am the Lord. That's my name. I love that verse. I am the Lord. That's my name. I will not give my glory to another, and I will not give my praise to idols. If I can take and do something by my skills, my gifts, my experience, my education, my money, my resources, my time, my efforts, then at the end I can say, look what Tom did. God said, no, no, no. Those are idols. I'm not sharing my praise with those things. You do what I call you to do, but I'll do the best because the glory is to the name of the Lord, and that is His name, not mine. Our God is a jealous God, but He's also a gracious God that calls us into these things, that leads us to Him so that we can see Him move. Do you kind of see what I'm talking about when I'm talking about this new life stuff? Do you kind of see where we're going? I, again, see things that God's already doing in our church. I perceive things that He's doing in our church. I hear from you guys, new life in your own individual lives, in your own individual mission fields. Embrace this moment. Let yourself get a little scared. Let yourself get a little overwhelmed and uncomfortable. Identify those areas you say, but if I do this, I'm going to lose this. Yeah, you are. Come to a place and get your father and say, God, I'm struggling with this. I don't want to lose my income. I don't want to lose my downtime. I don't want to lose 
whatever it is that's stumbling between you and him, because anything that stumbles in front of him is called an idol and you don't want it. Start working towards those things. Be mindful towards those things. Get on your knees before your God on those things. Say, God, I need you. I'm going to look like an idiot. God says, you're right where I want you. Look at verse 1 one more time. You are my servant, whom I will uphold. My chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him, and he will bring justice to the nations. Hold on to that promise. It is the word of your father.